I began to open up the Bible and read the Bible and say, wow. Now, I grew up in church. I, I heard, I went to Bible school. I mean, we had two week long Bible schools then. We had two week long revivals then. In August, in a tent, in the middle of summer, I mean, right at the heat of summer. And, and, and you know, and I heard all of the things that I began to read in here, I had heard before. There was nothing new, really, about what I began to read in, in my New Living Bible. And I don't think it was just because it was kind of a different translation. Actually, a paraphrase. The Living Bible is a paraphrase. Not really a great paraphrase, as a matter of fact. But at the same time, I began to open it up. And if you can see this right now, I just, I, I, I got wowed. For the first time in my life, I, I got wowed by what God was saying. And I wrote in, and you probably can't see this, I wish you could. I, I wrote here and here, and I wrote here and here, and here and here. I mean, everywhere there was a blank space in this thing, I started writing just what God was beginning to say to me. In the back, I mean, it's the same thing. You, you know, it's just, I mean, one thing after the other. And, and I'll have to say that I go back and look at it, and, and probably nothing in here is all that earth-shattering in one sense. But to me, at that moment in my life, it was. It was like I was hearing it for the first time. And I was saying, wow. I began to pour over my Bible. I began to read it from cover to cover. I mean, I've got notes in here from Ephesians, from Proverbs, from uh, every, every book in the Bible. And I just, for maybe for the first time in my life, I began to say, wow. And you know what? Those of us who are part of, have been a part of the church most of our lives and been a part of and, and have known the, the Scriptures and heard the Scriptures, one of the, one of the things that can happen to us and one of the real dangers for us is that we'll lose our sense of wow. These people were hearing the Word of God from Jesus. And in some respects, it wasn't different from what they had heard. But there was a difference. And for, the, and, and for the first time, many of these people were not just hearing somebody droning on and on about you know, what Rabbi so-and-so said, what Rabbi so-and-so said, what, because that's how they taught their Scriptures. They, but for the first time in their lives, they were saying, wow. They were astonished at His teaching. Oh, brothers and sisters, I wish, I pray for all of us that there could be a reawakening of wow. And, and you know, and, and here's the thing: when Jesus preached, you know, most a lot of preachers call attention to themselves, and they, you know, and they, and and, and but but a, the best preacher really doesn't necessarily call attention to themselves, but points past themselves to someone much greater, right? To to, to him. But, but Jesus was different because they were not just wowed by what He said, but they were wowed by Him. And the only one who really has a right to call attention to Himself in that way is Jesus. Is Jesus. Now, how can we reawakening the wow in our lives? The astonishment that these people felt. We need to be astonished again. And how can this astonishment be awakened in our lives? I don't think it's really very complicated. I, I think we just look at what, what happened here. It says that when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at His teaching. They were astonished at His teaching. And the first thing that we need to do is just carefully consider what He teaches Look at what He's saying here. I mean, when you look at the Sermon on the Mount and you see Him saying, love those who hate you and pray for those who despitefully use you. Bless those who curse you. When He says, 
Don't just love the people who love you, but love the people who hate you. Love your enemies. Anybody can love people who love them. Don't just love them. Love the, love the one who hates you. When he says, you know, don't just, you know, committing adultery is not just about what goes on with your body. Committing adultery is what goes on in your head. Hatred is not just, or, or murder is, is not just what goes on with your, your, with your body, the act of, of, of taking somebody's life. Murder is, is what goes on in your heart when you hate someone. I mean, you begin to read through this. And, I mean, just at the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are, are, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they will see God. Blessed, but blessed, and he begins to talk about all these blessings. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are, and, and, and all these things that seem so upside down. And the people listened, and they heard, and they heard what, what God had always been saying to his people. But they heard it as if for the very first time, and they were absolutely wow. The word teaching here is actually the word doctrine. They, they were wowed by his doctrine. You say, if I were to say, we're going to do a, a doctrinal, a set of doctrinal sermons the next several months, some of you would go, oh. but, but doctrine is what we have in front of us, right? It is the word of God. It is his teaching. It is the doctrine that, that God had, that he has given to us. And they were astounded by his doctrine. The scribes that taught them were so different from this. In fact, the scribes, their teachers of the time would just quote other scribes and they would say, Rabbi so-and-so says such and such, and Rabbi such and such says so and so, and so. And, and a lot of what they were teaching was they were trying to find loopholes in the wall, in the law, by the way. They were trying to say, uh, you know, like, okay, you can, the, the, the law says this. But you can do this if this. And they were they were looking for loopholes. Anybody ever done that with the Bible? Yeah, you know, how, how can I okay that that's you know that, that's not really gossip, that's a prayer request, right? And and and, and so I, it's okay if it's a prayer request. I put it in the form of a prayer request, it's it's good. And and what are we doing when we do things like that? We're or loopholes. We're trying to find ways around. And that's what the scribes and the, the, the rabbis at the time specialized in this. I mean, they, they, they okay, the law says this, but you can this. Or the law says that, but, it, but you can't do you can't that, but you can this. And they would have all kinds of ways of getting around things. You know, sometimes I think we spend so much time with the Scripture trying to say, well, I can get by with this, can I? That we lose any sense of holiness. And when Jesus said, Jesus said, be therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. It's not about what we can get away with. Would you agree? That it's about holiness. It's about completeness. It's about, it's, that, that's what that word perfect is about. It's about becoming complete in Christ. And it's not about, okay, how can I get around things? Jesus said about the teachers of His day in Mark chapter 7, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written. And they used that word, hypocrite. This, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me. They know the right things to say, but it's not in their hearts. They, they know the right acts to perform that would be called worship, but they do it with it, it's empty. It means absolutely nothing. Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. They took the philosophies of their day and they brought them up side by side with the scriptures and they taught them as if they were equal. Or even the truth. And, and what happens when you begin to do that? You know what will happen? The traditions of men will begin to rise above. Why? Because it's easier. I mean, it doesn't require the, the, the same of you 
And the traditions of men are all about trying to find ways to get around things. And, and so the, the traditions of men rise to the top. And the, and the people, the people were doing this in Jesus' day. In, in the time, in the day of King Josiah, you remember there was a, in the Old Testament, the, the people, uh, Josiah told the people to go and to clean up the temple. And as they were cleaning up the temple, what did they find? found the scrolls. They found the books, as we would say it. And they brought them out and they began to read them to Josiah. What did Josiah do? He repented in sackcloth and ashes. What had happened to the law? It had become secondary at best. It had become a dusty Bible on the shelf. It had become, it had become, and every, and so what were they living by? By the traditions of men. They were doing the best they could. <coughs> Excuse me. They were doing the best they could with what they, with, with, with the traditions of men. There was another time, you remember when Nehemiah called the people together and they opened up the scriptures together. What happened when they opened up the scriptures? People were devastated. Why? Because it was like they were hearing for the very first time the, the laws of God, the book of God. And, because, and, and, they, and they repented. It said they were weeping. They had to calm the people down because it was as if for the very first time they were hearing the Word of God. They had lost their sense of awe. They had lost their sense of wonder and astonishment. And now the law, the book of the law was brought out and the people began to hear it as if for the very first time. You know, at one point, Jesus was teaching and they sent, they sent the, the temple guard to arrest Him. And the temple guard came back after they, they were sent to arrest Him and they didn't have Jesus with them. Why? Because the, even the temple guard was astounded by what he said. In fact, the temple guard said, no one ever spoke like this man. And I pray that God would awaken that in you and me. And that we would not just be good churchgoers who go and kind of go through the motions and, 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 and hear you know, the same and, and hear it the same old way that we've always heard, but that we would hear the Word of God as if we're hearing it for the very first time. One of the primary ways that we will be, that, that this will be awakened in us, astonishment will be awakened in us, is we need to carefully consider what He teaches. And then, that secondly, we, we, in verse 29, for He was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. So secondly, carefully consider who He is. Carefully consider who He is. You know, they were not just astounded by what He said, they were astounded because of who He is. And, and as they heard Him, they began to understand that no one had ever talked like this man. Why? Because there was no man like Jesus. There was no one like Jesus. Carefully consider who He is. Let me give you three words here. First word, author. Author. One of the reasons he, they were so amazed and astonished by what he said is because he is the author. You know, when we think about authority, we forget the root word of that. The root word of authority is author. Author. The, 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 he, he spoke as no one else spoke because he is the author. The writer of Hebrews said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He is the author. He could teach the people on His own authority. You know, th this next year, 2020, is guess what? Another presidential election year. We just had one. I know. <laughs> didn't, didn't we? I mean, we just had one. And it seems like here it is again. And we're going to hear a lot of words. <laughs> words. And, and, and you know 
why so many of the people standing up in front of you, in front of us as the American people, they're not going to be speaking their words. They have speech writers. They have people telling them what to say. They have the party platform. And, and, and are they speaking of their own authority? No. You ever watch the Queen of England speak? We welcome you to our government. And she's reading it as if she's reading it for the very first time. And somebody wrote it for her. And she has to look at the blank in there somewhere to know who she's addressing. And, and, and I mean, nobody wants to listen to that, right? Nobody wants to listen to that. Why? Because there seems to be no authority in it. It has nothing to do with her. It has everything to do with her position and her representing, her representing that position. But when Jesus stood and spoke, they knew that this was from Him. He didn't quote anybody, and He didn't have to. Why? Because He is the authority. He is the author. And then the second word is the word theme. He is not just the author, He is the theme. I have to throw this in here because it's so important. When you look <laughs> I've had a, a, a sinus infection and, and, uh, and I'm kind of fighting through that right now. Forgive me. Uh, the, the word is the word theme, right? The word theme. And, and, and Jesus said, you search the Scriptures because you think that in them you have, the etern you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. He is not just the author. He is what? He is the theme. He is the theme of the Scripture. He can speak with authority because the, the, the Scripture speaks of Him. And then the word that comes from the whole of the Sermon on the Mount, the word King. Everything that He said and everything that He did was meant to point us to the fact that this is the King. He is the King. And the primary purpose of Matthew is to show us that Jesus is the King. Not a King. The King. The King. Listen to these words as I read them. Matthew chapter 8. And, when, and then Jesus entered Peter's house and he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought him to him many who were oppressed by demons and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and he bore our diseases. Listen to these words further on in chapter 8. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was, thank you, Miss Marita. Miss Marita is always a servant, isn't she? Thank you so much. And so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but he was asleep. And, and they went and woke him and saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm, and the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and the sea obey him? Look at Matthew chapter 9. And getting into the boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven? or to say, rise and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose, and he 
he went home, and when the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. And listen to these words. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making the commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. What do we, what, what do we gather from that? This one has authority like no other. At Jesus' authority, sicknesses cease, demons flee, seas calm, sin is washed away, and death is defeated. This one has authority. He is king. He was born a king. He lived as a king. He died as a king. And He rose again as a king. And He is coming again as a king. Isaiah said it so well when he summing him up when he said, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is the one who says to you and me, Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. This one has authority like no other. And for you and for me, what does that mean? That means that takes us full circle back to what we talked about last week, that, that, that everyone who hears the words that He speaks and builds their life on those words, what happens? The storms come, the winds blow, the rain beats against it, but what happens? The house stands. But everyone who does not do these words, exactly the opposite. The storms still come, but the house falls. The grave is the fall of it. Why? Because this one has authority over all things. So that demons flee. So that sickness is cast away so that even death cannot stand in His presence. Let me just give you some practical words about how we can, how we can recapture what it means to, to know the authority and be wowed and astonished by who He is. First of all, I would say, slow down. This is not on your sheet. You can write it in. Slow down. Anybody here like to be able to slow down? Yeah, I, I, think, I think we all would like to, but we're scared to death if we do, somebody's going to catch up with us. <laughs> but you know, I, I find something I do far too little of and desperately need and that transforms my life as much as anything on a day-to-day -day basis is just to slow down. To slow down and think through what it is He's saying to us. To let His Word soak in deep into our lives. To slow down long enough to meditate and hear what He has to say to us. The second thing, focus. You know, we, we have so many things coming at us from so many different directions. We need a time every day when we focus. You know, for years we called it a, a quiet time. Whatever you might want to call it, a motion time, whatever it may be. There is still tremendous value in slowing down and focusing. Focus on what He has to say. And you know something I found in my own life, and this is just very, really kind of a personal uh, experience work. Let, let sleeplessness, sleeplessness be your friend. Anybody have a night this past week when it was hard to sleep? Probably just about everybody here in one way or another, right? You know, and I get so frustrated sometimes. I'm laying there and I'm, and I'm even praying, God, help me to go to sleep. I just need to go to sleep. I mean, I, I pray about it. I pray, Lord, Lord, help me to go to sleep. 
And I won't tell you I've like heard an audible voice from God, but it's like here lately He's been saying, you know what? I'm keeping you awake for a reason. Because you need to listen to me. Let sleepness, sleeplessness be your friend. Let it be a time when God can speak most clearly to you. That 3 o'clock in the morning is sometimes the worst, seems like the worst time of the day, but you know what I found? It can be the best time of the day. Because it takes that for me to stop and listen and really hear what He has to say to me. And then take note of who He is. As you read through your Bible, looking at it, seeing who He is, and recognizing who this is that's speaking to you and to me. This is the God of all the ages who has revealed Himself to us through His Word, by His grace, to you and to me. He didn't have to reveal Himself to us, but by His grace and His goodness, He's made Himself known to us. Stop long enough. Take note of who this is that's speaking to you. You know what? When he is, when we are depressed, he is our joy. When he, when we are deciding, he is our shepherd. When we have sinned, he is our savior. When we are tired, he is our rest. When we are confused, he is our truth. When we are lost, he is our way home. And when we are dying, he is our life. And we need to be wowed by Him again. And I'm going to ask you as we come to a time of just commitment this morning to pray a simple prayer. Lord, will You help me to be wowed by You in a way like I've never been wowed by You before. Not by bright lights, not by some, fan, some, some amazing technology, but just by Your simple Word and who You are, what You have said, who you are when speaking. May I be wild by you again.